Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for those that are still awake, I guess, after lunch here. We're going to try to uh, keep it, uh, you know, a little bit uh, preppy and uh, hope for, uh, you know, some commentary uh, to the extent that you guys want to participate. And we, of course, encourage that. We want to, you know, bring that in as well. Um, I think this morning we heard a lot about, you know, how AI and automation is going to impact uh, a lot of other people's uh, work. Uh, but we thought it would be a pertain, you know, important to kind of maybe bring that perspective into how the CIO and IT organizations, as well as developers themselves, um, a play a role in this, but potentially get impacted by it themselves. Um, you know, I think that would be uh, quite some interesting, uh, you know, uh, thoughts around this. Um, so we will dive straight into it, right? Um, Basically, what I had uh, thought we could, you know, look at this as DevOps and, and the ease of access to technologies, um, you know, are continuously to, to be lowered and the barriers of, of, you know, engaging with these things are, are really, really easy. How does that really impact the relationship between IT and developers in particular? And, uh, you know, we always feel that there's some friction there, but like, you know, as, as that goes forward, you know, what would be some of the best practices that we are already starting to see evolve um, and some of the challenges that you know this might be bringing, and I thought I would start with Bill because uh, you have you know obviously the perspective of a CIO who you know have to deal with some of these uh, innovations and and you know deal with the longer term effect of, of this. Yeah, it, you meant scars. <laughs> That's, That's you your words, but yeah, right over the years. Well, it, I thank you, Anders, for for allowing the practitioner to go first here in the conversation. <laughs> Um, you know, if you've, you've done this a few times uh, as a CIO in different companies, you realize you have that unique relationship with the development community. You know, I've spent most of my career uh, working with engineering companies, engineering companies that have become progressively more software defined X, right? It, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you're building radios or you're building uh, autonomous vehicles or you're building software platforms themselves. We do more and more development. I'll start with a little bit of a provocative statement. And, and I really believe this today, particularly as, as we work at NetApp to automate more and more workloads and processes for engineering for our customers. I think CIOs today have a responsibility to at least partially uh, put themselves out of work, uh, to, so to speak, disintermediate some of the things we've traditionally done, right? So historically, CIOs would produce platforms for the development community. You know, we'd configure servers, we'd build infrastructure, data centers, and um, we would make sure that the right operating systems and layered tools existed in those environments. And it was kind of like going through the short order cook and sliding your piece of paper saying, this is what I want, you know, when can I get it? That's all got to be automated today. So as IT practitioners, we have to build environments that are self-configurable, Right? They are based on a request, a software point and click to build an environment, to spin up a virtual machine, to spin an operating system layer up on top of that, and then build out the tools, the layered tools, to allow developers to run at the speed that they need to run at. And then when that workload, when those workloads are done, to be able to wind that back down and put those resources into the pool. So our goal is to get, as, as CIOs, is to get out of the way. Right to keep from impeding that process. And that's part of how I look at agility in an organization today. Then uh, maybe, Julia, you want to go on and sort of like bring your perspective to this because you run a really interesting division and, and are obviously on the developer tooling front and, and spend a lot of time thinking about that. But how do you see sort of like what you are doing and an enablement that you give, the power that you give to developers and how does that fit into sort of the way that IT and, and, and you know, yeah needs to, to think about this. For sure. So first of all, you know, DevOps is such a interesting term. And you know, when I talk to companies, usually the first slide I put together is DevOps is the blind touching the elephant because everyone has a different definition. And when we think about DevOps, we really start with, we say, we talk about four continuous motion. It's by the, the way to continuous planning, continuous development, continuous release, as well continuing monitoring your application you know, in the real world to understand whether it's actually delivering the business outcome. So it's an entire, it's a loop, right? It's not a one thing. Um, so in that, in that world, we have been talking about this notion for the last five, six years. And then you know, we talk about, when we talk to organizations, it's not just the tools, even though we build the tools. The tools are used to go help an organization, the people and the process right. to deliver outcome. 
And it's up to the organization to decide what is the right process. And again, developers cannot remember all of the things that an organization mandate them to go do. And I like to say developer knows one, two, and too many. And the rest of the procedures and you know, requirement has to be built into the tools. So they don't have to remember these things and the tools help reinforce that from an organization perspective. And then where we think the CIO and then in the organization can provide the most value is provide that global fabric of visibility of project status, visibility of how things are going, security, cost management, those fabric are critical for the CIOs to deliver, for all the engineering team to sit on. And then after that, you want engineering team to have as much agility in deciding which tools they want to use and may the best to win is kind of the mentality that we have. So how do you govern and balance sort of the ability for developers now to pull in the greatest and latest in open source tools, beautiful APIs, all of a sudden your application definition, what you build is like half of it is outside of your control. Uh, you know, who, who, who helps the enterprises you know, tackle that particular problem space and how do you balance sort of like ability to lean in and, and, and be, you know, uh, consume the latest and greatest, but also put sort of the provisioning and controls in place? I mean, yeah. I can go, but I won. <laughs> I, th I think that, um, what, what we see, and, and JFOG was uh, founded before the term DevOps was existing. Right? We, we didn't know even how to, to name it. We just called it software automation and software acceleration. And, and I think that one thing that everyone in this room will agree about is that we are in the business of speed. Because the only thing that you CIOs want to have is a faster release and a more secured release. Yeah. And in order to achieve that, by default, you have to combine the world of, uh, of the machine with the world of the developer. Developers are very important, but you need to, to automate the processes and you, and you have to secure the processes in order to be faster in the market and to, and to be um, in a good spot in the competitive landscape. Um, what I think that become more and more the challenge for, for you know, C-level managers is to accept the fact that some of, of what developers used to do and some of what the ops used to do start to be on the same, on the same ground and some of the developers are being replaced by, by automation and some of the ops kind of uh, um, um, have to give up the, the walking by the book processes. And, and this is the biggest shift that you should allow in your organization in order to allow it, in order to enable the speed that we are talking about. And where do you feel sort of the cutting edges today on, on how people operate and think about that? What the cutting edge? Uh, yeah, like who's doing something really interesting there and, and then how is that, what, what do they do with the excess operational people? Is, is it... So what, what we see in the market that there are, you know, everyone, I completely agree with Julia, um, you know, every, every second company um, in the world of software, enterprise software, software infrastructure is a DevOps company or an AI company. Uh, and, and whatever UVCs want to see in the first slide. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think that uh, the main thing about uh, the change comes from technology uh, uh, point of view and um, from, from human capital point of view, if I may. So from technology point of view, people care less about versions and, and code version and, and you know, Git repository, code repository is super important. But if I would just ask a prov provocative question here in the, in, the, in the room, how many of you guys are using LinkedIn? Raise your hand. Everyone, right? Do we have one single person in this room that know what version of LinkedIn he uses? <laughs> no, because we just expect it to be updated and it doesn't matter if it's a cloud service or if it's an on-prem service, this is what the market expects you to deliver. And in order to do that, you have to release seven times a day. So this is the technology, this is the cutting edge of the technology, these are the assets that you have to promote and accelerate and automate. On the human capital, you have to also look at the change that happened in your organization. Some of the people moved from being developers to being DevOps, and some of the ops moved from being IT to be DevOps. It's kind of a mix of cultures that, uh, that start to be 
a new creature. We call it super DevOps. You probably have it in your organization. Those people provided as a service to the rest of the organization. Um, so this is the mix of, of edges I, I see. Yeah. I think I'm going to go add something contrarian to what you say, just mm -hmm. to make it interesting. I mean, you know, the tools that we develop, you know, we have over 10 million users from a monthly active perspective. So we see a really great breadth. I don't agree that every single software project will look like LinkedIn with no versions, because there's a lot of usage in life science, in machinery, nuclear power plants, you know, submarines, in these places where, you know, like they actually take the versioning very carefully because they don't want to go re-rev the entire thing. So in addition to agility and security, the quality for the particular scenario is critical. And, and now it reminds me of a recent conversation I had in Japan with the Japan Railway. And then, you know, they have the entire, you know, CIO, they have websites that sell tickets that can go rev seven times a day. You can run AB experiments and all of these things. They also have the physical software that run the train. And then the way they develop those software, the amount of testing you have to go in there is critical in terms of, like, you don't want them to go seven times a day. Like, I wouldn't feel good riding that train. <laughs> um, and I think that you know, we do have to make a difference in terms of what does that look like, what is a particular industry. And, but I would argue, even for that train situation, there is a DevOps life cycle. It doesn't run seven times a day. But the critical thing about the DevOps lifecycle is getting the, be clear about the customer outcome, be clear about business outcome, and have a way to continuously evaluate, are you achieving that outcome? And for that particular situation, what is the right way to actually increase your feedback cycle so you can actually deliver that mean time to feedback in a faster way? And those are actually completely achievable. Yeah, I, I would add that there's a lot of focus always in terms of reducing failure rate, right? That's a natural inclination. And the, the first instinct is how do I you know, take control of everything that I need to take control of in order to absolutely minimize the chance that the failure occurs as much as possible. Um, but I would argue uh, in many organizations what is as important as the you know, failure rate is the cost of a single failure, right? And that's going to be very industry dependent. It, the cost of a failure for a railway could be quite high. Um, um, but the cost of failure in terms of a you know, web application where there might be a 500 error or something like that can be quite low. So um, I think you need to balance both the, the failure, you know, change failure rate as well as um, optimizing your time to realize um, that there's an issue, you know, time to detection, and then being able to remediate those with an appropriate proportional investment um, to really give yourself the maximum leverage. Yeah, I completely agree. And the one thing that you just mentioned now, security, and we didn't kind of yeah. answer your open source question, I feel like we start to keep talking about DevOps. I, I definitely see way more usage of open source in all enterprises. And um, you know, I, at the same time, I think that not all enterprises fully understand the challenge of using open source, because that did come from a culture of shipping seven times a day. And so you're constantly required to move to the tip and then for a lot of, you know, depending on the application, you have to go evaluate, is that the right model for your particular application? It may or may not be. And then you have to understand if you're unwilling to kind of follow the pace of the, of the open source project, right. you actually want to go stop a particular version. Then you have all of these classic questions of, well, what happened about security? You know, if I need a patch it, how do I make sure this application is secure? And these problems today are much more left at the, sort of like this exercise of the user. And I think as CIOs, you know, I think developers are like, yes, open source, open source, open source. And I think it is the CIO's job to think through that fabric of what is, how do you actually understand what are all the open source usage in your company looks like? And are they being used appropriately? And you know, are, they, are they used for the right scenarios? And you know, if you do need to have a mitigation of security, do you have the right way to mitigate? Uh, and I think the other thing that is broadly known for paranoid people like us, because we run clouds, um, is today this entire, you know, there's some very recent news about the supply chain attacks. And we really see that in every single dimension of software. And so today when we download a package, you know, I think, I'm sure JFOD does a great job securing the supply chain, but there's a lot of people just download package from a open source site, you know, NPM site or this and that. You have no idea whether that package, that binary, is actually built with the source code. You have no idea what compiler they used to build it. You have no idea whether in the process, whether the security of these package downloads, there isn't a man-in-the-middle attack. 
And there's a lot of new challenges we think CIOs really have to go rethink about what that looks like. Well, I can respond to Julia's comment, because you're about the third person today told me what my job is, and that's sort of how <laughs> all CIOs operate, I think, in the modern world, right? We got, we got a lot of advisors out there in the different organizations. But I want to get back to something you said and something Shlomi said. So Shlomi said, you know, look, you know, you're, you're going to get into this continuous integration, continuous development, the seven releases a day, which is absolutely true. The reality of, of us CIOs is that we live in this hybrid cloud reality and we're gonna be there for some time. We're gonna have these large stranded workloads that are part of our traditional industry that, that, that gets back to what Julia said. I'm gonna very carefully revision those, right? I'm gonna be very cautious in, in how I roll them out because they're the mainstay of the organization. And they may be in a traditional data center, right? I'm also gonna have larger, more progressive applications with true DevOps environments and automation in a private cloud. And I wanna to get to that private cloud as fast as I can to automate and get high utilization in turns. But then the, the rest of the reality is I'm gonna have multiple investments in SaaS platforms in the cloud by partners like SAP here, where I'm gonna go out and get fast moving application turns that I don't have to manage on that day-to-day -day basis. And if that doesn't create a big enough challenge, I'm gonna to go to the true hyperscaler cloud world, the AWS, the Azure's, the GCP's, and I'm gonna build out my digital transformative apps. And that's where I need to get into the high rev. That's where I need to get into that true DevOps cycling. So we're gonna be a little schizophrenic for a while in the hybrid cloud. That's why we all act a little funny sometimes storing the ways, because we're looking across that reality. And I think the big question is how do I inspire more, my organization to get more nimble and more agile in each of those platforms, right? Because there's not one DevOps solution. There's a series of progressive get faster and, and get more nimble. And that, that's a huge challenge to an organization that, 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 that's performing across such a broad spectrum of delivery. I think that uh, to, to Julia points regarding security, first of all, I, I fully agree. Um, and regarding open source and, and what you guys have to deal with, Open source is, is a fact already. It's, it's not a revolution, it's a fact. Right. Whether you like it or not, it's happening yeah. in your organization. The Firehoss is already connected to, to, your, to your team, yeah. and you proxy thousands of packages a day from different hubs. It's, if it's Docker or NPM or Maven Central, mm -hmm. you don't even know. The second thing is how can we automate that to, 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 be, to be fast enough yeah. and to build fast enough and to secure the process. And I think that uh, what, what we see today in the market, although the DevOps market is super chaotic, okay, let's, let's face it, it's still not a mature industry, but it's start to be something that you can trust, is that automation um, includes few very fundamental factors. First thing, is speed, because it's all about that. If, if, if I will suggest something very secure, but it will take you a year to build, then why, why you need it? Second thing is security, and the third thing is to be open to the world, because someone out there already built it, you don't have to build it again. We saw the, uh, the analysis from GitHub that 90% of the code in GitHub is reproduced. We saw the analysis of other package repositories uh, that what, what you have there was something that someone already created. So if you want to be fast, if you want to be competitive, then you have to, to be open to this kind of change and to secure it so it will fit to your organization world. And to what you mentioned, Bill, I, I, I can't agree more that we live in a hybrid world. Mm -hmm. uh, we did our Series C with Sapphire three years ago. Some of the VCs we met in the industry asked us if we are uh, focusing on the cloud momentum and said, we are frogs, we are amphibian, we will live here, we will live there. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that was funny, but, uh, but we meant it. Yeah. Um, now we just concluded our Series D, and nobody asked this question. Because even Microsoft and, and uh, AWS and GCP, they all work on, on a hybrid solution. The world understands that there is another new mentality in, in the world of uh, Dev and DevOps, which is the freedom of choice. Let someone build whatever he needs in the environment that fits him. Yeah. How I mean, does that change the skills required, both on the developer side as well as on the IT side? I mean, it's a, that's a pretty huge uh, you know, impact. 
the ability to kind of have that freedom, but at the same time, you have to you know, provide the velocity and still deliver quality and, and so forth. Yeah, well, I would say that one of the skills that's becoming increasingly uh, important for any sort of senior engineering role is really having an understanding of what is available and what can be put together into a, a solution. Because if you don't have that understanding of you know, what components are already out there, what companies are already solving, um, you know, developers that sit down and they first reach for an editor are really doing themselves a huge disservice. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of traditional software engineering, in a way, as a software engineer, I think I can say this, it's basically glorified plumbing, um, and it has mm -hmm. been. Uh, and now, the, you know, the plumbing is getting easier, right? So, uh, and there's a lot more, you know, to stretch the metaphor, uh, pipes available to put together. Um, and so the, the real value add is being able to kind of move from the role of a plumber to somebody that's more of a, a consultant and elevating the conversations that you're having and uh, being able to blend solutions together. Well, I think that, I mean, I, first of all, I completely agree with that. At the same time, I think that you know, as a developer, what, I, what we see that you know, there's all of these new skills that developers expect to learn every day. There's, you know, like there's a new web framework every, you know, every other month. And you know, like now people are talking about AI machine learning. I can tell you, even within Microsoft, when we have an AI conference, like you know, immediately sells out. Like everyone wants to go learn the next new hot thing. And one of the key notions we start talking about is that you know, at some point we think that every single developer will become AI developer. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say this is like 30 years ago, when relational database was first introduced, that was a very specialized niche. No one knows relational database. Right. Now any developer knows, like, oh, no SQL. I know. You know, I cannot necessarily be a database admin, but you know enough to be able to program yeah. the right pieces and find the right pieces for databases. And we think that for AI, a lot of new algorithms are getting invented today, but increasingly that you no know, more tools and more of these things will make it much more approachable developers. And you know, we talk about things like Kubernetes and containers and TensorFlow as if they were well-known terminology. <laughs> these are old terms that just got introduced in the last two, three years. Yeah. And so it's really talk about the learning curve for all of the developers I have. So I think that one of the most important skills for developers is to understand all of these business landscape, this technology landscape, understand what are new things they need to go learn, and have a rapid learning capability. So talking about speed, it's also the speed of learning. And be able to really understand the business problem and outcome, and figure out in this, you know, like there's all of these startups, and then there's 10x number of open source projects. Right out there and pick out like which one you can actually bet on and which one do I have to go write myself and how do I collaborate with my teams to actually deliver a business outcome. And I think that is going to be a whole lot more of the new skill set that you know the pace of innovation is picking up. So the speed of learning has to pick up as well. Yeah, I mean I think you mentioned kind of the four elements of continuous uh, yeah. earlier. I think yeah. the, the fifth one might be continuous improvement really. It's kind of like another axis of the same thing. Actually I would say the goal for that circle is for continuous improvement. And I think that's really moving away from the notion that we know what you want as a, you know, as a vendor or, like, or as a product. You know, what, I will get it right in one shot, right? Like that's you only need to go do this in once. And the whole notion of continuous improvement is that customer experiences and customer demands and business demand will continuously changing. You have to continually improve that from a product cycle perspective. So yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey, hey Anders, I, I, I got to bring it back to ground here for yeah. just a second. <laughs> I got these glorious, talented developers here. And first of all, I'm going to compliment them. Thank you for APIs. <laughs> okay, every CIO in the room, look next to you to the developer and say, thank you for APIs. <laughs> it's amazing what we can do and how it speeds up our business, right? I want to bring it back to data for a minute, okay? I'd be remiss not to bring it back to data. I, as, as a CIO, when I look at deploying solutions for customers, whether they're internal customers or external customers, you know, we deploy software, right? We run software but we leverage data, okay? Data's where the value is, okay? Because that's what gives us the kind of information, it gives us a, a definitive competitive advantage in whatever industry space we're in. So data becomes extraordinarily important, and data is spread all over that hybrid cloud reality, and data doesn't necessarily align between the application environments. So as we talk about this, we always have to think through that is how we're going to make sure that data can be accessed in timely, fa in timely fashion and utilized. And several of you just brought up the fact that you don't know 
what your developer, what your customer is going to need next. We don't know the kind of solutions and the kind of data that needs to be brought together and assimilated to provide real value on, on behalf of our customers. So I think it's something we have to constantly work towards making sure that we can manage uh, data across this hybrid cloud world. And I'll tell you, as a practitioner, and I look back on my career, the things that have been the most troublesome and painful have always been with the companies around dealing with data. Is it timely? Is it clean? You know, is it current? Are the data definitions the same between two data sets when I bring it together? And how come I can't get them all time aligned to draw logical conclusions, right? So this is something that's always near and dear to my heart as we go and talk about development and fast development and, and migration of application capability. Yeah, and if you want to scare an engineer, using the phrase data synchronization is probably one of the best <laughs> ways to do it. <laughs> so watch them go for the door. So how do you react to a statement like, oh, developers suggest a new standard for software code or frameworks? Uh, you know, it might be all the, you know, the coolest, latest thing, but nobody has the crystal ball. Yeah. Um, and then it lands in your lap after yeah, and, you know, a couple and look, of cycles. And the reality is that's a great point because we're going the other way. With IoT and, and you know, are we going to get the standard? Yes, but we're going to produce more data types and more interesting permutations on data than we are standards in a hurry, right? So you're going to have to move to analytics capabilities and, and data lake models that allow you to bring in uh, you know, ELT instead of ETL assimilation of data and then let your data scientists have at it. Right? That's what we're going to have to do. This, there's not, I mean, data standards will evolve, but so will new data types through time. How about collecting data on the IT and, and development organizations themselves and, and, and that process? Is that something that you guys are thinking about? When you say, tell me a little bit more. Uh, so like efficiencies, how do you, how, how do you hold yourself accountable? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think our job is to provide platforms and tools Okay, that bring data together in timely fashion, that run the jobs that need to be run quickly. So any analyst, in my view is most of the, now I'm going inside, I'm, I'm doing an inside in look at how companies operate. Um, what you really want to do is to be able to simulate data so the data scientists that sit in the ops organizations, most of us have them. We got sales operations, we got supply chain operations, we have finance operations. That those operations teams, with their data scientists, with deep domain knowledge, can go into that rich platform of data that's pulled from wherever, whatever part of the cloud, your private cloud, your public cloud, your hyperscaler cloud, and make inferences and make competitively dis defining decisions on how your business is going to run. It may be how you're going to supply you know, material. It may be how you're going to price your products, how you're going to do discounts, how you're going to run your campaigns in a marketing operations group. And that's what's going to differentiate the outcomes from the performance of the company. I'm not talking about the product itself. I'm talking about the performance of the company. I will say that you know, my customers are developers. Yeah. Right? So let me speak for developers for a second. Because you know, I get asked this question all the time. How, how does Microsoft you know, evaluate perform, you know, efficiency of your development team? And what kind of KPIs do you use? And I always have a little bit allergic reaction to questions <laughs> like this, frankly. Because the, the reason you really drive efficiency is like you drive efficiency for like your more, it feels like more like menu labor. You can like really drive efficiency. You produce more outcome you know, every hour. But if you're thinking about Developers, you think about artists. You don't ask artists, like, what's your efficiency to kind of create a painting? You're like, you know, is the outcome good or not? And so, like, every time I think about this efficiency, and I, I tell you, I have, we have looked at this problem, right. at least using Microsoft internal data. Yeah. And, and like, there's, like, any sort of people say, oh, is it line of code? No, it's not number of lines of code. Is it number of commits? No, it's not commits. Hmm. How do you evaluate quality, business outcome, you know, how a person spending time helping others around them to be more successful. There's a combination of hard metrics and soft metrics. One of my favorite example in this is that uh, one of the top uh, computer scientists, his name is also Anders, Anders Hausberg, who invented language like C-sharp uh, and TypeScript. And when he first invented TypeScript, you know, we had an engineering team, top tier engineering team that built the compiler for it. And then you know, he looked, like a year or so later, he looked at it, he was like, mm, I think this thing can be done better. So he spent six months, he rewrote the whole compiler on his own. There's like 30% less of code, like 30% fewer lines of code. And the thing runs three times faster. So like, I don't know what metric I can use. And right. you know, he just kind of wrote it, and then he just kind of 
check it in, and so I don't know the number of commit. So I'm like, you know, like you never want, that to me is awesome, right? And like, like there's no efficiency metric can measure the contribution of something like this. Um, so this is why when I think about efficiency, it's like, you know, it's always like, how, how do we really talk about whether all of the effort is spent around the right business outcome? And then you allow the creativity of developers to flourish, so they think about new ways to solve the problem and not be kind of constrained. So going back to the I, problem uh, skill set and all this. Uh, just about the efficiency and, and maybe to take it back, and, and, and JFrog is selling bottom up, so we, we, we actually we don't meet this audience on a daily basis. So, but to take it back to the C level and speak about efficiency, I, I agree with Bill. Like the, the main thing that DevOps brought to the table was dealing with metadata and providing REST API for automation. Yeah. And this is efficiency. Because efficiency with better developers, that's the, 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 I think for the longest time, that was a challenge when you, when you manage talents like, like engineers. But the efficiency, the new efficiency that we are talking about, and I'm sorry, I know that, that this might be a, a bit um, in a conflict of what I heard here, I think that DevOps is not about continuous integration, and it's not about continuous deployment, and it's not about continuous testing, and it's not about continuous delivery. It's about continuous updates. Because if I can promise you guys that you will get your software from A to Z secured and fast, I will solve your pain. And the milestones of continuous integration, and we are all in, in, the, in this business together, and I fully agree that this is a very important milestone. These were milestones, but we have to start with the end in mind, understanding what we are trying to achieve and how we want to help developers and how we want to make their day more efficient and more useful. And the only way to do that is to say, hey, now I can help you connect to a machine with the REST API that I created for you. My, my source is open for you and go crazy and be more, more efficient and more creative. That's right, I think that efficiency is really about how do we make the development team more efficient in delivering the outcome, not to measure yeah. individual efficiency in the way that people want to go measure. I think that's exactly right. I think uh, you know, developer metrics and productivity and looking at those types of things are very near and dear to what we do every day. And I think that there um, is a little bit of a risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of things like um, you know, talking about software metrics, the first metric that always comes up in conversation is lines of code. But <laughs> <laughs> um, only in the sense of people saying it's a bad metric. So there's nobody really saying it's a good metric. It's just that everyone wants to talk about it as a bad metric. Because that's really um, <laughs> weird. There's not enough other good right, metrics. Right. right. So yeah. I, I think um, you know if you want to look at okay, how are my teams doing? What is their you know are they getting more productive or less productive over time? I think there there is some need to be able to ha start to have a handle on that, right? Yeah. Because if if you're spending more and more money on software R and D every quarter, and the only metrics that you can track are headcount and cost, you know eventually that's that's going to kind of crush itself under its own weight. Right. Yeah. Um, you got to find a way to keep people accountable, right? Yeah. So this, you know, the so. way that we talk about it is, uh, the happiest developers are on the most productive teams, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to kind of optimize things for an engineering organization, you could do a lot worse than sort of figuring out what are the things that are driving the engineers on this team crazy. And those are kind of like your leading indicators, and then your lagging indicators. I think you can do worse than looking at things like you know the rate of changes being deployed or delivered or updates being delivered, and then how often are those updates successful versus not. And there's some really interesting research that's um, been done that suggests that organizations that actually um, deploy more frequently have a lower change failure rate than organizations that deploy less frequently. So you might think about it as like, okay, well, we can improve our success by kind of slowing things down and applying more checks and balances. Um, but there's actually been some fairly large scale um, uh, research that suggests that those things are actually predictive of one another. I, I so that's a takeaway that you can walk away from here and like get the velocity up uh, and, and just you velocity know, start. up and it comes and the benefit is you also get fewer errors yep. so like they, they, you don't need to choose between quality and velocity you can have both together super I'm gonna stop us there because I want to see if there's any questions mm. from the audience as well uh, you have a really broad spectrum of, of uh, you know people on the panel here that mm. you have a chance to engage with no no takers all right any final words from Julia or oh, no, so, I think there's a oh, there's a microphone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> he rescued us. He rescued us. Um, so speaking from the point of view of the CIO having to manage across this highly fragmented type of delivery mechanisms across all of these technologies, 
as we're going through this change, what role do you think the CIO has in, in setting culture in how to address this change? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's really a great question. Uh, one of the things that worries me is when we start having these discussions about this bimodal culture, you know, which kind of to me feels like the haves and the have-nots. You either get to work on the cool stuff or you get to work on the old stuff, right? I mean, to some degree it feels like that. I think it's setting an expectation that, and, and I, boy, the way I think of the, all the stuff that was said here, I, you know, I think Brian's comment about faster is not only faster with its benefits, but it implies better because you got more rigor, you got more repeatable process, right? And you got less drag on the operation. Yeah. You probably have more automation and other things built in, right? So I think you have to set the tone for an expectation that the RPMs in the business are picking up. You have to let people know that it's okay to venture out in the cloud and you're gonna stumble a bunch of times, right? You're gonna get a couple of bills from your cloud <laughs> providers that were runaway job streams because your developers forgot to shut things off after they started them up. And you're gonna have to get into that, that accept and adopt and learn and evolve kind of culture. And that really does have to be set from the top, that it's okay to do that. And we're not gonna run all our workloads on the left or the center or the right. There's a place to go digitally transform your business. And I suggest that's where the hyperscalers sit because that's where the marketplaces are. And most of the tool platforms I'm looking at here on that, that presentation went right before us <laughs> are companies that are born where? In the cloud. You guys aren't writing new tools for us to roll out on-prem very much, <laughs> right? So that's where you do your digital transformation, get bold, get brave, and then run those large, required, consistent workloads that you're not gonna lift and shift anytime soon and try to get that into your private cloud model, right? Because it'll be more stable and more cost effective. I think you gotta set that messaging that it's gonna be a little bit frenetic and, it, and it's gonna be heterogeneous and you're gonna have to deal with that confusion for a period of time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Thank you. you know? Cool. Actually, I, I want to add one yeah. more thing on culture because, you know, like I will say one of the big things that allow Microsoft to change so dramatically in the last three, four years mm -hmm. is we really focus mm -hmm. on culture. Yep. And when we think about what it means, you know, sort of like reflecting our own journey of what it means to focus on culture is that you really have to define what are the new culture values. Like what was the things that you were not doing before? What is the difference? What is that new cultural value? And then with that new cultural value, what are the new behaviors you're expecting from your employees. And then it requires a lot of repetition to talk about this is a cultural value, this is a new set of behaviors, and that's the only way. Otherwise, you know, I like to say that the employees will walk into the job every day and kind of do the same thing. So unless you're very clear about what changes are expected of them and why we're making these change, it's gonna be very difficult to incur, make that change actually happen. That was one thing that we spent a lot of time working through. And I, I, I would like to add one thing. First of all, when, when we look at Microsoft from, from the developer startup point of view and, and what happened in this market and how close big, big organizations get to developers, saying that developer first is the, is the new statement, that, that's awesome, that's new to us. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with what Bill said, but I would like to add another thing that we see as a change, and this is the bottom-up process. Mm -hmm. Our champions, are, are your employees like at the bottom of, of the production uh, layer, those are the people that start to adopt tools and they start to, start to bring them in. And, and you know, it's the question of best of breed versus a platform, it's a question of uh, efficiency, it's a question of open source versus a closed uh, source. And, um, and what I think, if I may, I've never been a CIO, so maybe it's very challenging, but I think that being open to this change, mm. that you know, we, we say in JFrog, binaries for the people, the, this revolution that happened from the bottom up is something that, uh, that I hope CIOs will start to be open to. It's, it's a very important um, change that happens in the market. I think that's gonna be it, folks. Uh, thanks a lot to the panel for uh, helping us through here. Thank you. Thank you.